Hi, everybody. I'm Derek Burmel, the Artistic Director of the American Composers Orchestra. And welcome to our professional development webinar series co-presented by the American Composers Orchestra along with American Composers Forum. Today, we are going to be talking about entrepreneurship and ensembles. And we have with us three of the most creative and knowledgeable people in the biz. Uh, with us, we have President and Artistic Director of the Sphinx Organization, Afa Dworkin, violist, radio host, and curator extraordinaire, Nadia Sirota, and composer, pianist, and interdisciplinary artist, Sugar Vendel. And along with them, we have our moderator, Frank J. O'Terry. Uh, I have a few tech reminders for you, uh, for the audience who's tuning in right now. Please use the Q&A panel. Uh, it's a button, I think, at the bottom of your video if you want to ask questions. Uh, we're trying to save the last 15, 20 minutes uh, for questions and engagement. Um, and you can use the chat function to interact with fellow attendees. Um, this piano will be, uh, <laughs> listen to me, this piano, uh, this piano, uh, will be recorded and available. Actually, you don't want to hear this piano recorded and available. Uh, but this panel will be recorded and available on ACO's YouTube and the American Composers Forum's website. Thank you so much, American Composers Forum, our partner. Um, thanks to the Virginia B. Toolman Foundation. Thanks to NISCA. Thanks to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and our individual donors for helping fund this series. And thanks to our staff, Aiden Feldkamp, Jay Jung, Mosa Tsai, Lindsay Working, and our new president, Melissa Nan. And now I would like to introduce our moderator. Uh, our moderator today is New York City-based composer and music journalist, Frank J. O'Terry, who is the composer advocate at New Music USA and is the editor of its online magazine, New Music Box, which many of you read, I know you do, uh, and some of you even write in too, perhaps. Uh, as well as Vice President of the International Society <clears throat> for Contemporary Music, ISCM, and a member of the board of the International Association of Music Information Centers. His own musical compositions, uh, Oteri uh, combines emotional directness with an obsession for formal processes, and uh, many of his compositions incorporate alternate tuning systems. Uh, which we might also get to today. But in any case, Oteri, uh, recipient of 2007 Victor Herbert Award from ASCAP, 2018 Composers Now Visionary Award. He's a man about town. Welcome to our moderator, Frank Oteri. Wow, thank you. Wow, that's quite a quite an intro. Um, I, I love for people to introduce themselves. So rather than hearing my voice talking about all of the wonderful folks we have assembled today. I want everyone to introduce themselves, but I'm going to preface, I'm gonna do an umbrella preface with everybody because everybody in this panel wears multiple hats, but the one common denominator with everybody on this panel is that everybody began their careers as a performing musician, some of whom still do that very actively. And that's sort of a prism through which we're gonna look at this world and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna turn it over to Afa to introduce herself and we'll do brief introductions and then we'll get into the big debate. Afa. Great. Um, Afa Dworkin, I serve as President and Artistic Director for the Sphinx Organization. By training, I'm a violinist. So today I call myself a recovering violinist <laughs> since I spent the last couple of decades really in the space of um, imagining the work of the Sphinx organization whose mission is transforming lives through the power of diversity in the arts. Um, I'm a big um, supporter and a champion and enthusiast and a lover of um, new music. Um, through the work of Sphinx, I have a great privilege and an opportunity to empower and amplify many of the living composers, particularly black and brown composers, and help evolve our canon as such. So a lot of the space in which I find myself is that incredible work um, of collaboration in the space of learning from living composers and the voices of today who are redefining and reimagining what music should sound like today. So I'm, I have this um, incredibly uh, privileged spot of working in that space and, and through the work of our performing ensembles, particularly the Sphinx Virtuosi, which is a collection of soloists who travels around the country as a small chamber orchestra, 
uh, we get to curate a lot of programs that respond to um, the ever-changing landscape, the social landscape uh, in the world, and do a lot of this reflective programming that creates space for new voices and composers of today. And uh, of course, the work of String Symphony and our um, choral ensemble Exigence also uh, focuses heavily on living composers. And um, it's as such, I'm so looking forward to hearing from my colleagues and learning more about this space of, of redefining what classical music should sound like. Excellent, thank you, Afa. And uh, Nadia Sirota, very active performer, but also a radio host and a, a uh, an interviewer, a podcaster, uh, many, many, many hats, but I, I do think they all sort of began and emanated from performing music, but I'll let her. Yeah, hi talking. everybody. Um, thanks you, thanks Frank. I'm Nadia Sirota. Uh, I play viola kind of at first and foremost, um, and everything that I do is centered around the sort of central core of getting this awesome stuff, which is to say, you know, music that's written for these classical instruments out to as many people as possible. Um, and that's been my kind of, um, I guess, mission statement for my entire career. So oddly, my career has sort of branched out in funny directions, including, you know, curating, um, hosting, podcasting, broadcasting, uh, producing as of late, um, all sorts of stuff like that. And all of it is because I love this music. I love composers. I specifically find that um, a really great way to get into what we call classical music, for lack of a better term, is through the music of now, through the stuff that's happening right now. Um, unlike you know, really anything else, we tend to say, you want to get into classical music? Let's start from 250 years ago. And I think that's a really weird way to get people into anything. <laughs> so um, I love the music of today and I try to promote it in everything that I do. Awesome, thank you. And Sugar Vandel, who's a, a performer, a soloist, an ensemble member, and also a composer in the last few years, a very, very interesting trajectory that once again begins with performing music, but I'll let her explain. Hi everyone. Yeah, so I'm Sugar Vendel. Um, uh, I founded an ensemble called the Nouveau Classical Project in 2008, and it, it changed a lot over the years. It actually started out super classical, like hyper classical, because that was my background. And, you know, I started meeting um, more composers and just getting really into what they did. Um, you know, sadly, to be honest, back then it was like, oh, if you're playing new music, it's because you really can't play your instrument. And that that's just not true. Um, so anyway, like I just, I let the whole thing evolve with me. You know, it's like, well, I like this music and I want to promote these people, then we're just going to do it. I don't need to have, you know, some overhaul and like, um, you know, tear the whole thing down. So anyway, it's evolved over the years. Um, it started uh, with me just wanting to like express my identity um, as someone who, who loved actually fashion um, as a form of expression. So I just connected the two things and then it grew from there into doing more multidisciplinary things. And then um, I kept wanting to do these collaborations, but I'd always tell people what to do. And at some point I realized like, if you have such an opinion about everything, why don't you just make the damn things, you know? And anyway, like um, it's because I was too scared and then I finally got over that fear. So anyway. Long story long, um, uh, yeah, I have the ensemble and I compose now and I'm, I'm much happier. <laughs> so I'm gonna begin this all with a rather loaded gun question. Since this is supposed to be about getting composers to think entrepreneurially and to, to come up with strategies for success in the in the, the strange year of 2021. Well, we don't really, we could talk about how things were like uh, before this last year and hopefully how things will be after this last year. And then we'll kind of take a segue into talking about the uniqueness of this last year. But there's an assumption that I wanna challenge. And since you're all performing musicians and all started out that way, there's this assumption that if you're a performer, an interpreter, you're somehow extroverted. You like being on stage, you like interacting. Whereas if you're a composer, 
you sit, you know, with your manuscript paper, you know, your face, you know, in the in the manuscript paper, and and don't talk to anybody, and let your you express yourself through those notes, and that's it. And you're you're completely introverted and not capable of dealing with the outside world. I I don't think that's true as somebody who's super extroverted myself. Um, but I I want you each to kind of talk to that issue of how your own personal way of interacting with the rest of the world has affected your transactions in the music bits. Anybody, jump right in. Uh, I'll do a little bit. Um, I, I think these myths and the boxes into which we wish to place ourselves and others are kind of hilarious, especially in this day and age. Um, I think by nature, we're all people, right? So we all tend into one direction or another, but I have, I don't think, I don't think it's so easy anymore to find folks who fit into a singular category or a singular box neatly put away and categorized. Um, I'm deeply introverted by nature potentially, but um, I think that's so hardly relevant um, because the hats that we all wear are multiple um, and I think as both innovators in different spaces, as well as collaborators and supporters and enthusiasts and cheerleaders for so many artists and collaborative artists, um, new voices, composers, young people, um, I think we, we get to change those hats so frequently that I think those definitions no longer matter, much like what it means to say, I'm a classical music composer or I'm a performer today. Um, I think because my work at Sphinx has had to reshape me into an advocate, um, into somebody who uh, sometimes needs to use their voice and, or often their voice and the bully pulpit to advocate for an important issue or to insist upon what something should mean and or in, in my case also advocate for equity of access and exposure. Um, I think it is it's almost impossible to say I'm an introvert and therefore I'll go sit in a corner um, because I know ultimately I, I've learned early on in my career that I can do nothing alone. <laughs> so as such, we're all kind of collaborative artists, collaborative advocates. By definition, that means we're never simply introverts, but it also means because we're human beings, we're never simply extroverts either. Sometimes you need a retreat. And, and maybe put your head together with a couple of trusted colleagues um, to really formulate a message or a piece of advocacy or a next step to act upon. So I think we're all these like adaptable hybrids and that really is the only way I know to be and the only way I encourage um, many of my students and mentees and artists and colleagues to be because I think we have to sort of be all sorts of things in order to not only survive but also to thrive and to serve. I just want to build a little bit on what Appa said. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because you have to think about. I think introvert and extrovert, as applied to these roles of composer and performer, it's kind of a false equivalency. Um, I do think it is a performer's job to do something that resembles what an extrovert might resemble, because a performer's job is to take this intention that a composer had and translate that to this audience. So that resembles what an extrovert does, but I don't think it's actually the same thing at all. I think you can be incredibly good at that translation and not particularly like hanging out at parties. And I think that's fine. <laughs> um, I think those are sort of different things, but I do think it's really important to understand that like the composer's job is to ideate, right? And figure out um, what the thing is, what the music is. It's the audience's job to receive this music and they're either it's either being directly received from the composer directly to the audience or via this other weird medium of performer and i love i love being a performer i love that role it's sort of like being an actor or being a dancer it's this intermediary thing you don't have that thing when you look at a painting and you don't have that thing when you read a book those are both the creator sort of delivering it directly to the audience so i like that we have this strange role because it's especially it's a role that i especially dig and like and it's um it's fun to advocate for somebody else's ideas which is, is what i feel like that idea is to kind of bring this back around to entrepreneurship which i think is the the subject of this um panel you know 
music as an industry is a industry of relationships. And you can look at that cynically and say, oh, it's all who you know, blah, blah, blah. But you can also look at that, um, whatever the opposite of cynically is, optimistically, something like that, um, as you know, you're allowed to bring your relationships, whatever they are, forward to be the thing that music is. And, and one thing that I kind of wanna, um, this is gonna sound obvious to some people and not obvious to others, uh, hopefully who are listening, but there is no panel, there's no grand um, organizational panel of like people who decide who's gonna be successful in the music industry and who's not. <laughs> and I think when I was a younger um, artist, I don't know, I pictured like somebody saying, you shall be successful and you shall fail and I shall you know, endow all this stuff upon you. And it's not, it's just people trying to do their thing. So if you, when I say it's a, it's, it's a business of relationships, I mean, um, if you have a whole bunch of friends and colleagues and you guys are all making music that you really like and you really like each other and you're supporting each other and you're going to each other's concerts and you're helping promote each other's concerts, you've, guess what, created a scene that's gonna be something that attracts people from outside that community. And that is literally like the entire secret to building a career. It's just creating a community and supporting each other. And it's not that like this opportunity comes at the expense of this one. So if somebody gets a commission, it doesn't mean that somebody else doesn't get a commission. If somebody gets a concert or uh, opportunity, it doesn't mean somebody else doesn't get that. So instead of like clawing at each other and trying to get opportunities at the expense of somebody else, if we can, as a community, all support each other, all go to everything, all make everything happen. It's the it's that old adage of a rising tide raises all ships. Um, so this relates to the comment about extrovert versus introvert, because sometimes people hear this and they get stressed out that you need to be an extrovert in order to create this community in order to be successful. And what's really nice about a community is it's not made up of all the same type of people. Um, in fact, one of the keys to successful collaboration is bringing people to the table with different strengths. If you are always gravitating towards people with your exact same skill set, it's going to be great for the first like month and a half, and then you're going to butt heads because you guys do the same thing and you probably have different ideas about how to do the same thing. If you can bring people into your community and your collaborative life who have different strengths, then you're all taking up a different part of this big thing and there's going to be overlaps, but it's great because this person's a great communicator and this person's a great graphic designer and this person really understands tuning systems. This person has a relationship with these venues. This person does X, Y, Z. You're going to have a lovely time. And the same thing happens with introverts and extroverts. You can be an incredibly introverted performer, let's say, who plays the piano like crazy. And if you find your community of people who need to work with an awesome pianist who's lovely to work with, who is always super prepared and doesn't love to talk from stage, you're going to be in great shape. So you have to find your community and that does not need to be an extroverted act, but it needs to, it needs to be there. I think the hardest way to be a musician is to be by yourself and wait by your phone for somebody to discover you. I don't believe that that works terribly often, probably works occasionally. Everything works occasionally. Um, but if you want to sort of a key into entrepreneurship and, and growing a career, this idea of finding your people and, and people that you want to support is, is a really helpful thing to uh, work on. We got our first question in the Q&A, and I see Af already responded and wants to answer it. But before that, I want Sugar to get a word in about this thing I threw out there as somebody who's both a performer and a composer. Where do you feel you fit on an extrovert, introvert? divide and does it make a difference in the successes you've had? Um, I mean, I'm actually a total introvert, um, but, and, you know, of course, like people think I'm, it's the opposite, right? And that I have an easy time, like asking for money and like that it was all just like, oh, like easy, but I'm terrible at asking for things. I hate making people feel used. I'm the worst. It just, but like Nadia said, like finding my people that really helped like I you know I just I'm very much a one-on-one -on -one person and then you know those people found other people you know who got who get involved in what I'm doing and I'm really grateful for that so um, I'm gonna keep it short because I know we only have like <laughs> 40 minutes and I, I want to get to other topics but um but yeah I don't it, it does seem that way and sometimes I'm like man I just suck at this because like I'm like I'm not like like it salesy enough you know so uh but i i think that you know we've done pretty well and i'm 
pretty happy with how things have gone. Um, so yeah, I think it is definitely misconception. Um, I want to riff on something else that Nadia said that that kind of took me by surprise and, and, and took us in a new direction, talking about how we have a different realm from painters or from novelists and poets in that, you know, we have these these intermediaries. But, you know, in a way, everyone has an, an intermediary. You know, the painter has the person who frames the painting or chooses not to frame it, or the curator, how it's hung on the wall, what it gets hung with. You know, the, the book, you know, you don't judge a book by its cover, but good Lord, people do. And so a, a really nice book design is going to be really attractive and it's going to make you want that book. And the author has nothing to do with that most of the time. And then, of course, if you're writing in another language, you have to deal with a translator. But we all have these intermediaries and even composers before the music gets to the performer has intermediaries. And I think we're living in an age there's a, a big buzzword of disintermediation, that this is an era where we all kind of figured out ways to do things ourselves. We publish our own music, we release our own albums, we start our own ensembles, we have our own venues, which slides very nicely into the first question that was posed there. We were gonna have a, a, a more formal Q&A period, but I like keeping things kind of informal. And it seems like a good segue into this idea of you know, what are the kinds of things that you need to do? Should every composer start their own ensemble? Everybody looks to the model of, you know, Philip Glass, Steve Reich, and Meredith Monk, and even generations before that, you know, Mingus and Sun Ra and, and Harry Parch had their own ensembles, their own record labels. They did everything themselves. And that's great to some extent. It's a different skill set. It was also a struggle for a lot of those folks, and they weren't getting Backing and they weren't getting funding and they barely survived. And we we remember them now and they're iconic, but it's, you know, the, I, I definitely want us to talk to that, the kinds of sacrifices that one makes and the choices about which sacrifices we make. But Afa, you wanted to jump in specifically to that question. Maybe we want to read that question, but it disappeared from the screen when it got labeled answer. There. Um, yeah, I, I was. I, I saw the question and I thought it need it deserves time because it seems fairly central. So, I, of course, hearing from my fellow panelists um, would be amazing. It did disappear, so I can't verbatim, but it's essentially. Oh, it's uh, right here. If you go under and I can read the question. Oh, okay. great! Please do. Yeah. Do you recommend we simply get our own composer slash ensemble group together? to get our music out there or to have site readings? Is there a way to get funding for this? No one works for free, question mark, exclamation point. Thanks. Yeah, I, I figured I would only get us going, but I actually think it'd be really valuable uh, to hear particularly from my fellow panelists. Um, I, I, I know that back many, many decades ago when I was still in school, we did have such an ensemble. Um, which was really a collection of enthusiasts at the University of Michigan who loved new music. And we would um, cite read a whole lot of new music by emerging composers who were um, there. So the opportunity for us was incredible. Also the opportunity for composers to test drive things was, was, was also um, invaluable. I think um, the advantage of, of working with student ensembles is, is often where you might fit into existing structures. We had something called Brave New Works. Um, you, you might fit into existing structures where students are particularly looking for that experience and are in a position to do it in a way that fits within their curriculum. So you may not run into as many obstacles of not having professionals who'd work for free. Um, I know that's a real thing. Overall, I'd say it's, it's a valuable practice. Is there funding out there? There is. Um, I think oftentimes, particularly when things are recorded and cataloged and documented, there is actually funding that exists sometimes that's specific to a region. Mostly the funding that I know of it is foundation funding. Um, there's anything from Aaron Copeland Foundation to, to things that are specific to, to composers which are based in specific regions. Um, of course, more often than not, you do rely upon um, individual funders who are interested in new music. 
Um, so being unafraid to ask and survey and find those people who, who would be enthusiastic about supporting these new voices, um, it, and that does fall upon the composer. I'm very happy to take that offline and, and just share a bit more about the kind of work we've done directly with that, but it's a practice I do want to encourage because I think at times it's the only way to test drive something. Um, and that's how things get started. So I'll, I'll, I'll toss, toss it into the ether and see if someone wants to pick it up. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, that um, yeah, so let's, I'd like to discuss this from like, let's say the point of view of just a completely independent composer, right? That's trying to get this started. Um, no institutional funding, because you can't get that till you've been around for like two years. Um, you know, what do you do if you've got like no I, I mean i hate the word but like let's say you don't have product yet i mean um so you've got to just like get the thing going and then like you said no one works for free um and and but i mean you might i mean i don't like asking people to work for free anyway to be honest i've never i've done that like once and it was the very 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 first fundraiser where everyone had to play like one piece and then after that you know everyone got paid in some way but um I have like a couple like ideas for this. Um, I mean, like you save some money and for like a project to get started, right? Like save some of your money from your day job or whatever and, you know, get it going like maybe a small ensemble for like a piece for like three people and like, you know, you just got to get started sometimes. Um, the way I did it was like I had $175, maybe maybe 200 and that's how I had my first fundraising event. And then I paid for the venue rental. Like I was so dumb, I was so dumb back then. We rented like such an expense. It was when Barishnikov Arts Center first opened and like I didn't know how to like book, like get a venue to book us yet. Anyway, so um, the event paid for itself, you know, so like there's that way of doing it. Um, and I mean, do I recommend, do we recommend you simply get your own ensemble group together? Um, if that's the way that you have to do it and you can find joy in doing it, I really want to emphasize joy because sometimes like, I mean, like I've talked to other people who run ensembles in the city, like friends of mine and like a lot of the time, like we had this joyless experience of it because it is a lot of work. Um, but if you could find the joy in it and you know, make, you could pay other people in other way, be like, I, I can only pay you this much, but like, you know, I'll make you dinner too. And, you know, make people feel cared for. If you can, if you could do that, I think, you know, it's definitely possible, even if you don't have a ton of money. And I hope, I hope that's helpful. That's super, super helpful um, from my experience. And I, I want to sort of wrap that up in, uh, into another, um, maybe thing that's uh, addressing another one of these Q and A questions um, potentially, but I feel like there's two things that I really want to talk about under this, again, entrepreneurship as, as an idea. Um, the f and I, I do kind of want to get to both of them because I think they're important. The first thing is um, oftentimes we worry about reaching up above our own community. How do I get on stage with Yo-Yo Ma? How do I get, um, you know, a John Adams to promote my music? How do I get the LA Phil to play my music, right? Um, and the truth of the matter is, if you are building this community from, from where you are, so if you're a student, your community is your fellow students, it is not Yo-Yo Ma, um, you know, it's somebody right here. Those are people you can often get to work on something for less than a professional commissioning rate. I'm a big fan of making everything always transactional. If you ask someone for favors, they're going to do a bad job, they're going to push it back, something else is going to come in, they're going to say no. If you can offer someone to do something in exchange for dinner, a six pack, a drink, anything transactional where you're literally making a contract and saying you're doing this, you're just getting in the habit of doing this, but maybe this person is a student and they can totally afford to play your piece for the cost of dinner. That's totally fine for them. You guys are on equal footing. You're then building a relationship that's going to blossom into something else. And, you know, I work all the time with Nico Muley. It's part of the reason who's a, who's a you know, composer for those people that don't know. He's been commissioned twice by the Met. That's part of the reason my career is great. I did not start working with Nico when Nico was famous and I was not. I started working with Nico when we were both undergrads. That's how that worked. And we came up together and that made sense. Um, I feel like it's the answer is not simply build your own ensemble. The answer is find your people. 
And my advice to people who are trying to build a career, um, who are out of school maybe and trying to build a career is to really focus on these three things. Or uh, let me let me actually uh, amend that and say, the way I built my career is by focusing on these three things. I think there's a million ways to do it. I'm gonna share with you the way that I did mine. Um, the three things are that I find that I found really important. Number one, have a job that pays your bills. Um, this does not have to be a job in music. You are not a failure if you do something that is not music. Have a job that pays your bills. Um, figure that out. No stress, just get a job. <laughs> so that's number one. Number two, if you're a performer, this might be performer specific, um, but probably is composer specific as well as for a while, you're just gonna have to say yes to every single thing in your field that's offered to you. Some of it's gonna be awful. Some of it's gonna feel like you're not getting enough money for the amount of work you're doing. Some of it's gonna be terrible. Um, never play down to your audience. Never, you know, if you think your audience doesn't know anything, that does not mean you shouldn't be incredibly prepared. You never know who you're going to sit next to. You never know who is contracting it. You never know who you're going to meet. So there's a period of time when you need to say yes to literally everything and you need to have a job. Number three, and most importantly, and this goes into that third Q&A uh, question that I'm seeing, have a project that looks exactly like what you want your life to look like when you're fancy. Be doing exactly what you think you want to do when you grow up. And that third project, probably gonna cost you money instead of earn you money um, for, at the beginning for a long time. But the thing to really remember is nobody's gonna call you up with this dream gig where you're completely being actualized as your, for yourself as an artist, unless they've seen you do that before. Um, so for me, what that looked like was making an album on a credit card. Probably a terrible financial idea in terms of financial advice, but it really worked for me in terms of building up my reputation, my career, and creating something. And eventually, you um, are going to get be in a situation where the the gigs that pay your rent and the gig that is soul satisfying switch places, and you can stop taking the gigs that just pay the rent, and people will start hiring you for the soul satisfying thing. But I really think these three things are extremely important. The, the networking and music and just taking everything that you can for a while doesn't mean you have to take terrible gigs forever. It just means you have to take terrible gigs for a while. <laughs> um, have, a, have, a, have a job that pays your bills and work on something that looks exactly like what you want. If, if exactly what you want is creating an ensemble to play your music, that's awesome. That's not the only way to do it though. If you have something else that seems like, well, no, I wanna be a composer who produces my own stuff and is churning out tons and tons of electronic music that I never see in ensemble, that's awesome too. It, it, whatever, whatever version of your dream job is, you need to, it's really useful if you can, if you can go about um, creating an opportunity for that for yourself. I would make a slight variation on what Nadja said and, and Sugar seconded about having a job. Yes, indeed, have a job, but make sure the job that you have doesn't get in the way of your ability to do the other things you want to do. Let's say, you know, like if, if you decide that your other job is to be a medical internist, to become a doctor, and you're working, you know, 18 hour shifts, you can't practice your instrument. You can't go to concerts. You can't do the kinds of things you do. I mean, there have been successful people who have been artists and doctors. You know, the poet William Carlos Williams immediately comes to mind. But, you know, choose, choose very carefully. And if there's some kind of synchronicity between those worlds, that's the best thing. Um, there was a, a question that I, I see that Afa wanted to answer that I feel I should at least touch on before I give it to you because it does reference New Music USA, uh, where I work, um, that we did a survey that actually that survey of commissioning rates dates back to the existence of New Music USA to one of the two organizations that merged to form um, New Music USA, and that's Meet the Composer. And that was a commissioning survey that was put out um, for best practices. Um, like everything else, there is no fixed rate for a commission for anything. You can't say, oh, a string quartet costs this amount per minute, you know, a solo piano piece. It doesn't work that way because that's, that's you know, cooking books that goes against um, monopoly laws and you, you can't have a specific price for things, but you can have a range. So that guide was published with a range um, and it's there, it's still online um, with a calculator function that we added a few years ago to kind of make it more tech friendly. 
um, for people and, and to kind of come up with ballpark numbers. There's no magic crystal ball with this. Uh, we published an article on New Music Box a few weeks ago um, by two composers um, who did a survey in the last few years of commissioning rates and some of it conforms to what was in that guide, some of it doesn't, it's all over the map. Um, it's, it's a very tricky, very hard to answer question. Um, but the question that Philip raised in this might even be harder is to say, you know, who gives the commissions? Well, that could be just about anybody. An orchestra can commission a composer. Um, somebody might want a piece of music for their wedding and commission it. Somebody out of the blue might commission a piece of music for an ensemble to play as a, as a gift to somebody. It takes many, many different forms. You know, foreign countries, governments commission pieces, cities commission pieces. The National Parks Administration, it goes all over the place. Um, so there is no one size fits all. But then, Afa, you should jump in. No, I think you, you addressed it. You answered in a way that somebody pursuing the question through New Music USA would probably, um, conceivably might not find. So I, I, I'm not sure I have anything else to add to that question. But I, I do want to kind of only to offer a slight addition to what uh, both Nadia and Sugar have said relative to having a job that pays your bill. I'm also completely in support of that. In fact, for a, maybe like first five to seven years of Sphinx and its life, I had a multitude of jobs that would pay my way because you, know, you have to pay bills and that's the way to go. And when you're starting an enterprise that's completely new and does not fit anything, you often don't get paid for years. So I totally agree. But I also wanna encourage, and I do so to many of my students um, that I currently have the privilege of teaching and that is to say don't be afraid to find the skill sets that you do offer and and to put a value on the value you can bring so as i think a lot of times as musicians and particularly instrumentalists we're like afraid to charge for the work that we do whether that's editing someone's work or taking a look over at someone's composition or perhaps other skill sets that are inherent to you and what you offer don't be afraid to build an enterprise around it and kind of be your own boss and also get paid for the work that you do as you build a career and or portfolio career that may not ultimately look like the way it does now, but in the meantime, you might be good at something. So don't be afraid to like build an enterprise around it. And you know, the work we do as composers or musicians isn't just writing the notes or performing the notes. It's all these other activities too. I always like to say, you know, when you're a composer, you're a composer and you know, ampersand as, a, as an additional letter. And, and the same is true if you're a performer. Uh, one other thought on, on the day job thing, which I, I, I think is important, and I'm looking back to my own life. You know, I'm a composer. Uh, my primary sources of income are not from my musical compositions. They're from my writings about music, my advocacy for music. I work for New Music USA. I edit a web magazine. I do all of this activity, but I love that part of my life. And there was a time when I was younger, you know, you'd go to a party and say, oh, well, what do you do? Be like, I'm a composer and blah, 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 under your breath. And, you know, or you'd say you're a composer and say, yeah, what do you do to earn money? Um, now it comes to the point, you know, choose the job you choose to have it ideally be something as, that you're as proud of doing as the music stuff that you do. I, I think that's important because, you know, nobody wants to be miserable. Even if you earn a lot of money being miserable, it's like rather get less money and, and do something you're happy with doing. Um, there were more questions there. I, I see the, the clock ticking. I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't address some of this weird pandemic time that we're living in. So I kind of want to touch on that before we jump to the other questions. In terms of kinds of activities we can do, it's wonderful to see so many people performing music and having new works premiere online, but the economics of this is very tricky because most people think that they go online and everything is free. And some people have been able to make it work to charge and to have other models for these things. And I just would love to get everybody's perspective of how to keep a career going when it's impossible to perform live for the most part with a real audience. Sugar. Oh, that was a shrug, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I mean, career right now, that is such like an amorphous thing. I mean, we're all still who we are. You know, we're not, we haven't stopped being artists. Um, 
but like god in terms of monetizing anything right now like i don't know i just as a composer you you have commissions luckily right and i mean we we were already before this pandemic with the um, oh god i hope no no one here is like <laughs> under the age of 18 probably um whatever everyone starts cursing at like 10 so like um you know i mean even before the pandemic none of us were we weren't really selling recordings and stuff so it's already been on this decline and now it's worse you know with no live performance and so we can't really monetize live streams i'm sorry i don't everyone i keep getting these emails you know from like ASCAP or whatever like how to monetize your live stream I'm like it's not gonna happen it's just not so I mean I don't know right now it's just I just applied a ton of grants and like you know see what happens I kept my day job which is teaching piano um, which you know I actually love um, so I mean that I'm sorry that's just like not really an answer um, but I I think I'm I'm just waiting right now like I don't and I, I know that's a privileged position to be in right now. I don't want to just start becoming like a, you know, Zoom producer. I want to do the thing I want to do. Um, so I don't know. It's like maybe right now it's like we're all in a holding pattern for the most part and we wait till we're out. I mean, hopefully we're all getting that vaccine soon. I got to say that that um. One of, I, I refuse to say this pandemic has been positive because it hasn't, it's been awful. <laughs> um, but a, a positive outcome uh, for me has been that a lot of organizations have um, created a lot, of, a lot more opportunities for people to see music outside of going to the concert hall. And here's the, the, the dichotomy that is hopefully breaking down that I feel like is extremely important. There used to be this thought that like, if we record an orchestra playing in a concert hall um, and allow people to see that online for free, somehow we're going to create less demand for live events. And I think the answer is no, that creates more demand for live events. I was talking about this a couple days ago, but you know, the way that every non-classical music works is that you get a single, you push it out, push it out, push it out, push it out. You try to make sure people have heard it a ton of times. And then when the artist comes to town, you want to go see that thing live. Um, for some reason in classical music, we've been stuck to this idea of you can only see it live. You can't see it ahead of time. There's no way to uh, get to know this piece of music ahead of the concert. And you're only going to hear it once and it's once in time. And if you want to hear it in another way, you're SOL. And also our um, collective bargaining agreements make it unbelievably impossible for us to get this to you in any other way. The pandemic has forced us to look at that. And I think that is a positive outcome because the way that we experience every other genre of music is we get into something. We listen to it a few times and we get into it. We're like, oh, now I really like this. This is a song I keep on hearing I really love. The idea that for some reason for classical, new classical work that we can only hear it once is such a bummer. So hopefully this changes that dichotomy and we can actually start to get into stuff the way that we get into uh, music and other genres. Yeah, I, I I totally support that as well, and I think that's that's a part about um, just overall. I think in our field, there's also the euphoria of stating something in manners which are absolute. Which is, you know, I, I've been hearing things like, you know, the pandemic has been profound or transformative. It maybe, yeah, to some extent, it has. Been. It's also been really really challenging because it took money out of the hands and pockets of composers and artists and they have absolutely suffered. Does that mean then we close the door and we just have to stay in a holding pattern, not innovate at all? No, we also can't afford to do it. I think it's so much ties into the earlier conversation too, because um, I know with our artists and our composers we've been, um, where possible, Sphinx in particular is in, in a position to continue to commission new works because like to me, it's horrible, yes. It's profoundly difficult and challenging, absolutely. It's also going to end. We will eventually, like, um, this will sunset. It'll teach us some lessons, of which hopefully some, as Nadia said, we'll take with us. Others we will just discard because, like, this is no way to continue to create. Um, but but I, no matter what, the resiliency piece, however cliche, is an important piece to talk about, right? I think part of it has been to look at and say, Okay, what are other things you do? For some of our artists, it has meant that they're, they've expanded their um, 
instrumental teaching practice in the digital space. It can be unglamorous, but it also is a skill set for which you should get paid. And it is part of what you can do. So yes, teaching online lessons and where possible, I've tapped into our artists and, and said, I need you to do more of this right now because there's demand for it. And there's a whole lot of kids who are at home and actually there's, there's magic there. So, so doubling down on this other wonderful thing you do is important. Um, and, and also maybe looking for ways in which to collaborate with other artists and perhaps beginning certain projects that maybe respond to some of the social changes in our world um, and, and maybe creating works that will have legs post pandemic, I think not losing heart and, and continuing with that creativity um, that is possible. And it's interesting because one of the most challenging things in the world of what I do is raising money. And yet one of the most rewarding things in what I do is raising money because it's raising money for the most important thing, which is our today's voices, the voices of our artists, the, the voices of the composers who are reshaping what music should be like. There is money out there for what you do. It's just a matter of, um, it does take a great deal of effort and diligence of finding it. It's like, I almost feel like everything ties into the first question we answered. If finding your people also means finding the people who will help you get to the money to, to sustain your enterprise. And don't, don't, I would say don't lose heart because it's out there. It's just a matter of like actually finding it, finding the money that's specific to your region and also finding sources that invest into the, the importance and the power of, of these voices. So I think um, in many ways, maybe investing more time in tapping into that now when you kind of are stuck at home and we're not on stage might actually pay off in the end. We have three questions still unanswered in the Q&A and I have one more question I wanna throw at everybody kind of based on things that people are saying, but maybe my question is gonna, take us into this other crazy place. So we should answer the questions that are there first and hopefully we'll have time for my last provocation. Um, but um, I'll, I'll just read them and then we can kind of talk through them. Question from Marianne Parker. Those of you who have created your own enterprises, do you struggle with identity? Like if you had a period where you weren't associated with an established institution in any of your work, did you have a period where you had to mentally work through being your own proprietor? I mean, for most of my career, none of my work has been um, uh, supported by any institution. Um, it's kind of cool that there are some institutions now that I've been around for a while that are like, oh yeah, she's doing something. Let's see what she has to say. And that's amazing. <laughs> and I don't take that for granted. Um, but I think a lot of the um, the definition of entrepreneurship is, a is, is identifying a problem and trying to solve it, right? That's, that's what it is across all businesses and all, all you know, genres. There's a problem, this is how I'm gonna solve it. For a lot of us, the problem is I don't have a career, you know? Um, or like, I wanna do this concert. And Sugar, one of the things I loved about you talking about, you know, your first fundraiser and you're like, I didn't know this and I didn't know this and I did this wrong, et cetera. Like all this, all that we're talking about is just trying to do something. And like the second you do it, actually do it, you learn everything you did wrong. You figure out how to grow. You, you know what the problems are because you forgot to order chairs or whatever the thing is that you like didn't see, you know? Um, and, and most of it is like, if you just, if you want something to exist that doesn't exist, try making it happen. And then if you discover that in the process of trying to make it happen, that is not your bag, you hate it, that whole experience made you feel terrible, don't do that anymore. Find someone else who wants to do that. Figure out who in your community can fill that role. That's all totally fine. But um, in terms of struggling with identity, I would say, you know, we all we all experience moments of imposter syndrome. Probably we all go on a, a scale from feeling like we know tons of stuff and we're awesome to feel, feeling like we know nothing and we're terrible. And you just got to ca catch yourself in that upswing, get some work done, and then keep it going. Um, and it, it, that's another thing, a reason why it helps to have a community, because sometimes you can lean on, well, I know that this friend of mine is brilliant, so I'm going to sort of ride on my feeling like this friend is brilliant for a while and not have to rely on my own sense of uh, feeling like an imposter. And it, to be creative is impossible. I mean, it's wonderful and it's impossible, and you're going to have ups and downs. Um, 
but just make stuff happen because you might really make somebody else's day. And that's, that's how, that's, that's what I like to do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, can I just, yeah. again, like Nadia just always hits the nail on the head with the community idea. So in terms of, um, you know, not being affiliated with an institution, I mean, I was, I know it sounds like nothing now because it's like 2021, but like the whole fashion music thing back, oh God, I feel really old back then was like, like, oh, hmm, clutching my pearls. Oh, I'm wearing pearls. Um, you know, but like, I, I, I started it and this wasn't the best way to write. I was like already immediately defensive. So I was like, no, I'm not going to have institutional support. Like, you know, this is fashions associated with like superficiality and like I, I had like a whole manifesto written defending what I did you know so it's like I, I didn't even have that option you know in my own head like of like having support in that way and I mean try not to I know it's really hard because I mean I still like to if I'm being really honest it's like I'm still thinking like this I'm like oh man I wish this this organization would commission me and this one too but you know, when I have every day, I'm like, dude, snap out of it. Like, that's not why you do this, right? That's not why. Um, and there, again, with uh, bringing it back to what Nadi said about finding your people, finding community, there are people out there who will love what you do and who just will totally get you. You know, they're out there. And um, you have to focus on that. You know, we're such a classical music, new music, whatever. It's such a, like... You know, it's so academic a lot of the time and yeah like institutionally driven so that's what we tend to focus on and I'm personally trying to snap myself out of that like I actually told myself this week like you're not going to apply for any grants until like you know the middle of the year because all I do like I just turn them out you know so anyway if you could just it's like stay like stay the path right and the path is doing what you love and you know doing it with integrity and like being true to your heart um, that taps into this question. I just want to make sure that we get through the questions that people have submitted. Um, somebody named Jonathan C. Um, didn't give his full last name, said, as an undergraduate, I've participated in undergrad research conferences, usually STEM focused, and submitting to peer reviewed journals to present music analysis papers and my original compositions. This takes lots of effort. My idea is that working now at being published or listed as presenter will help me later on, but so far have not seen a return on the investment. None of my instructors ever presented at such conferences and have no advice. Will these projects help toward a paid composer career? True or false? I think I know what the answer is to that, but does somebody else want to give it? I'm very curious about your answer to that, Frank, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think you choose your projects, you know, if. if there, you know, if you do something for a small publication and it goes into this one little silo, it's not going to really reach people outside that silo. And I think it taps into what we were saying before about choose your community. Be very careful what those choices are. And if you want to do a project because you love it, good Lord, do it. Do the project that you love. Um, but don't expect other things to happen from it. Ideally, you shouldn't do things only for the transactional value, you should love it as well. But ideally, it should be both. You know, you should be doing something you love, but it should be leading to the next step. Um, and that ties kind of nicely into the provo pro provocative question I wanted to throw out there. I read a, an interesting article in the New Yorker by Amanda Petrozic earlier this morning, earlier this afternoon, actually, it's the afternoon now, um, for all of us, um, about this it's the, the time old article about does genre mean anything anymore? And what do we do when there's no genre? And this is talking about, you know, will the Grammys ever not have genres for their awards? And then what happens if they don't? And everybody here has been saying classical, classical over and over again. And there was this incendiary article in Rolling Stone about Juilliard and what Juilliard needs to do because somebody there didn't know who Bruce Springsteen was. Oh my God. Right. Um, so maybe we're killing ourselves by constantly saying, classical and new music. Maybe we just need to stop that and stop siloing ourselves. It's music people. I don't think we're siloing ourselves, to be perfectly honest. I think that people who are creating are just creating. I think that um, we obsess with what to call it. Oh, it's not like this is the first time anyone said classical is not a great term, right? Like we obsess over this thing. New music's a bad term. Classical's a bad term, blah, 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 blah. 
I think you can make whatever kind of food you want to make. I think when we talk about classical, often that's sort of like, well, I was trained as a French chef, but I'm making Japanese fusion cuisine right now or whatever. That's sort of a similar way to put it. It also, it also, um, it also doesn't really matter. Do I somehow secretly think that if we can find the perfect term that it might actually become way more popular? Yeah, maybe I have that thought, but I think the bigger issue at hand, honestly, is that culturally in this community. So I'm gonna call, I'm gonna now call out the cultural community of classical music um, as something that is inspired by universities and conservatories where people learn this stuff. And culturally, we have a huge pro we have a lot of huge problems. But one of them is we tend to talk about what we hate all the time. We tend to talk about other people's performances being bad, a conductor being a hack, a composer being derivative. Like we're obsessed with this kind of conversation. Um, and I think we're obsessed with it because it's safe. It's way easier to think that people might think you're smart if you can talk about stuff that's awesome that you hate, then people might think you're even smarter, right? Like that's something that just gets ingrained to us in conservatory, or at least it did for me. Um, and why would anyone come to listen to something that has incredible historical gatekeeping problems if we're also talking about how terrible it is? It just doesn't make any sense to me. So instead of obsessing over, oh, we have to not call it classical, we have to not call it new music. Maybe that's true. I, I'm into it. Figure it out, Frank. If you have the answer, let's go for it. I'm, I'm great. I'm, I'm happy to adopt something else. But most importantly, I would really love to change this culture and for, to have us start talking about stuff that we love publicly. Performances we love, composers we love, people who are undiscovered who we love. I mean, it's one of the things that Sphinx does that I think is so wonderful is it's advocacy. It's you're really talking about artists that people might not have heard about and saying that you love them and this is why. And um, that's the single most attractive thing we can do is be advocates for each other. All feeds back into this idea of community and finding your people. If you have a composer who you think is absolutely brilliant, tell everyone about it. We all know how hard it is to be advocates for ourselves sometimes. So if we can just be advocates for each other and talk about that stuff, I feel like we're gonna be in better shape. I, I love, love what Nadia just said. And, and I think, and it's a yes and, um, absolutely do tell the world about the music you love and then also freaking program it and take it on stage and perform it. Um, I think I'm hearing a lot more, the volume of the conversation about what folks love and undiscovered music and you know some folks that are unsung, great, awesome. Uh, then also please program it and please record it and please work and commission these composers who are here right now make a choice and just like don't take another work from the canon the classical canon I think in, in some ways what you're tapping into Frank is right I think there I probably do see a time and a day when we don't have to call something classical don't have to call something the classics or the canon because we'll evolve be beyond that but i think it like comes from the practice and the practice thing is something i want to see more of the actual walking of the walk and yes it's even possible to do this in the pandemic totally because we all make choices and even if it's those of us who have like transitioned into teaching more like instrumental lessons on online and maybe we don't love it as much but we have to do that to sustain ourselves you know what even there we're totally making choices we're every time teaching a 12 or 13 or 15 year olds and you're electing a piece of literature you can like elect the piece of literature you love and want to advocate for and if we all do that like we will shift we'll, we'll be better we'll do better by each other and by the field that's a great note to end on, and the clock is ticking against us. I would love to keep this conversation going, but I think they need the Zoom line for something else. So I'm going to invite Derek back to say a few final words and lead us off. Thank you so much. I want to make a clap, big clap emoji for all of you. And um, I want to go back and have a separate conversation about where we just got to, because I think it says so much about um, you know, we're, you're getting to some, I, I knew, I knew that was what was going to happen right at the end. We're going to get to this uh, just incredible conversation about the field and, and, and it's some of the problems at the, at the center of the field. So I love where this discussion went. Thank you so much. It's kind of meta to talk about your own career, but you did it in a way that was powerful. You all spoke from the heart. Thanks to our audience. You made it what it was, this talk. Uh, 
uh, and look out for an email from us with a link to recording and post webinar survey. Um, and you can check the chat for the link, which should be coming through. Uh, please take a few minutes and fill out the survey just so that we can tailor our future programs to your every desire. And join us Wednesday from March 24th at 3 p.m. EST, that's Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I think it's still standard time, or it may be daylight savings, for another webinar about equity in orchestras. We're going to go there with a moderator being ACO's own president, Melissa Nan, uh, the panelists, uh, Nibal Meso, composer and consultant, Daniel Bernard Romain, my colleague from University of Michigan, composer, violinist, and educator, um, and Pratiji Shah, president and CEO of Flourish Talent Management Solutions. So thank you so much to ACF, American Composers Forum staff, especially Billy Lackey, thank you Billy, uh, Laura Kreider, Damian Strange, and Vanessa Rose, some of our favorite people. Thank you Afa, thank you Nadia, and thank you Sugar. And thank you moderator Frank J. O'Terry. Um, this panel is recorded and it will be available on ACO's YouTube channel and American Composers Forum's website. Thank you all for joining us.